Hello and welcome to this episode of the White Deer Filmmaking Podcast. I'm Mark Wisdom and um, today we are talking um, about uh, Conviction Without Remorse. It's the next episode in our Conviction Without Remorse series um, and this episode is primarily based around the acting within the short film. For those who don't know, uh, Conviction Without Remorse is the short film recently made by the judges of the White Deer International Film Festival um, and the co-directors as well, um, of which I am one of them. Uh, we also have of Alistair Railton, who you'll see in this podcast, and there's Adam Sandy as well, who is another co co director and one of the judges for the festival. And he did the uh, he was the director of photography uh, for the film. Previously, we've spoken, 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 spoken about the cinematography, the art direction, the writing, directing for the film. Um, but today is acting, and this one's very special to me because I acted in the film, I am an actor, and um. Yeah, really good to just delve back into the creative decisions taken for the film. Um, I play the junior barrister in the film. Um, in the episodes today, we have uh, Christian Dapp, who plays Dominic Farrier, Rita Sigmund, who plays Brooke Farrier, and uh, Simon Crudgington, who plays James Cashaw. If those names don't mean anything to you, which they probably won't, you can check out uh, a bit of context on our website. Sorry for the background noise today. Um, it's uh, have to have the windows open because it's extremely warm, um, but hopefully you can forgive me. Um, we have featured in the podcast who I've just said, or the actors I've just said, but also Alistair Railton, who directed the film. And our guest host today is Amy Clarkson, who you might remember from a podcast we did a few months ago um, and who we spoke to way back into the end of last year. Um, uh, Amy's film, Life's Rich Tapestry, won Best Directing for the November-December Bi-Monthly Awards um, in 2019. Um, we loved having Amy back on. She's an incredible filmmaker, an incredibly personal uh, filmmaker, really... Uh, puts a lot of her personality into her films and her film just has a lot of meaning to her uh, which we were very curious to delve into in the podcast when speaking to her. Um, her film also features Tatiana Anders who we've spoken to on the podcast a couple of times. So thank you to Amy and thank you to the actors for joining us um, for this episode. Hope you really enjoy it. There there are a few issues we, we must uh, make you aware of. Um, unfortunately there's no visuals today. Really it's a big shame but uh, the we noticed when we were doing the editing that um, some connection issues had made the visuals for the podcast almost unusable, um, which is a real shame. However, um, what is really essential for this episode is what is being said, um, not exactly um, seeing the you know the words be said, but what is said. Um, that that's what's key, and we, we've got uh, the majority of that all okay about 90 percent of it is perfectly fine there's a few the connection issues have made them a few slight delays but also um some slightly odd noises here and there but for the most part it won't affect it at all and i think you'll really enjoy this one and um yeah hope you hope you like it so without further ado over to amy hello all are hello. we all good hello. yes we are yeah oh, great uh, wonderful okay so <laughs> For those of you who probably don't know me, I'm I'm Amy, and I'll be doing the interview for this evening, which is fun. And I'm here with Mark and Alistair, who you all know Hello. from the White Deer Film Festival before, and Christian, Rita, and Simon, who are in Conviction Without Remorse, which is a great film. I've watched it four times in total, I'm not going to wow. lie. It is really good. Um, so yeah, just to kick start, really, just for people who are maybe coming to this as their first podcast, maybe just a quick summary of the film for me, there maybe Mark or Al. Okay, um, yep, yeah, sure. Um, so Conviction Without Remorse uh, details the life of, well, the convicted life of Dominic Farrier, who has been recently sentenced to, um, uh, to jail uh, for the murder of his friend, James Kershaw. Um, Christian played Dominic and James Kershaw is played by Simon. Um, I play the barrister who is called to the waiting cell um, to speak to Christian who works out that something isn't quite right and more needs to be discovered and we have a um, quite a intense conversation trying to find out um, what's going on. Um, Rita plays Brooke who is Dominic's wife um, who is uh, an incendiary character in the film we should say uh, without giving too much away. Wonderful. So, um, mainly for the actors, obviously. So, when, how did you first really hear of the role that you wanted to play in, and 
when reading the script, what kind of really attracted you to the role that you ended up playing, really? Feel free to, whoever wants to go first can jump right in. Uh, Brooke, I can start with you if you want to. What kind of attracted you to Brooke's character? And from reading the script, what was kind of the, what bounced off the script for you, really? Is that me? Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, um, you know, as all of us actors, we, we have these platforms that we use. Um, uh, we apply for roles on there, and um, I just saw this casting breakdown. And I really loved it. I, I I tend to just listen to my gut instinct. If if it sounds good, if it sounds professional, if I like what it's about, if I connect to the description of the character instantly, then I instantly feel okay. This is what I need to apply for. So if I feel that from the start, that I know it's the right thing to apply for. And then the guys were kind enough to to ask for a self tape, and it was one of the most interesting self tapes I have I, I had to do. Um, there were two monologues that I had to improvise. Um, they just gave me two situations, as I recall. And uh, yeah, I just sat down and I just studied. Um, I didn't even know what I studied. I just, I just, I just used my imagination, I guess. <laughs> and um, yeah, oh yeah, I remember I also read the casting breakdown for Dom. And that gave me some inspiration as well. Um, so then, yeah, I, I wrote myself two monologues i recorded them and apparently i got them right so <laughs> that, that that was all from do you remember what the situations that they gave you that you had to go with uh i remember the first one the second one i i don't i'm sorry guys sorry. <laughs> it was almost it's a year ago, ago. Yeah, it was a year. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah was it the improvised piece rita mm. no, no 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 that was something else the, it was the, so the, initially the, you yeah you gave me the situation situation of of a wife being unhappy in her relationship in her marriage and having a discussion with her psychologist with her therapist and what would she say to her so that that was I think that was the first one and then the second was yeah the second one I think was um the monologue that ended up being in the film as well um, yes after the murder yeah. Didn't know that. That's right. Yeah. That's yeah. interesting. What was the what was it like for you, uh, Christian and uh, Simon? What was the kind of attraction for from the script or from the role that kind of wanted you to go for it? Um, who wants to go first? Simon, go for it. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I'd uh, been fortunate enough to work with Alistair and Fresh Air Films before, so I was in one of the uh, the lucky situations of, of 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 some great filmmakers reaching out and saying can you please audition for this role that we have? Um, so we went through the, the audition process and there was, yeah, I remember some improvisation um, videos that we, that we were doing. And looking at uh, my character, James Kershaw, he's come back from uh, his time in the army uh, and he's got PTSD. Um, so sort of sitting in my room off, kind of just going through that whole idea of, army situations from the 70s what might ptsd be like but improvising that before researching and really truly learning it was a really kind of interesting experience i think we correct me if i'm wrong Alistair, but i think we found some really unique stories in that that you must have enjoyed and then once oh, we yeah. were sort of I was lucky enough to get the part that's that's when i delved into the, the research yeah so you didn't do any research before doing your audition you kind of wanted to take it in yourself and then develop as you were going along yeah, I think it was one of these things where how much time do you have between prepping that audition? Um, not that Alistair didn't give him plenty of time, but it's sort of how much time can you commit to an audition? But if you've got a role, you, you just put your all into it and put, put so much sort of research into the back. I mean, I like, I like to prep as much for auditions as I, as I can, but you, you simply can't for everyone. Yeah, that's really interesting. That's what was great. really interesting to watch, though, um, with Simon is... Um, well, for all three of you, had different ways when you're on set, but Simon was doing research even on the set as well. I think because he had you had a book um, which you was uh, which you'd used, and it was great to sort of take a look. That that was the the first time for me which I saw the kind of the research that you were doing, what you were reading about, and when I saw that, it was it was about PTSD and uh, and yeah. the aftermath of being yeah, a soldier. Yeah, it's called Battle Scars by mm. by Jason Fox and. On a film set, there are times, obviously, when you're waiting around uh, yeah. as actor or crew, uh, whoever it may be. And I think that my first day of shooting, we, we had a scene um, 
a short scene I was in and then I sort of had a large gap before my next uh, time on set. And I, I found it really useful to say, you know what, I haven't really delved into this since yesterday. I want to delve into it some more right now. And I just carried on reading through that book. Um, what was the yeah, kind of research? Yeah. What was the book kind of, uh, well, what did you kind of learn from the book really that was kind of, must have been really interesting to research PTSD in the 70s because it wasn't almost a well, diagnosed thing back in those days, I that's imagine. That's a tricky thing. I mean, the, the book itself wasn't from a guy from the 70s. Jason Fox, I think, I think he was in, the army in sort of 2000 sort of days. Um, but the same things ring true, like the way he was describing the situations he was in. And he talks about this can happen to, this has happened to soldiers for years, irrespective mm -hmm. of what time zone or war zone or political situation or whatever it might be. Yeah. Um, but always coming back to the same sort of feelings of despondency or despair or sort of alcoholism or, or all sorts of, of issues sort of just stopping um at a at a, a road crossing and it's on mm -hmm. green go but you just stood there five minutes before mm -hmm. you realize where you are um yeah. so there's the stories are really interesting because it's this macho thing where he talks about there is no mental health issues and men don't be ridiculous uh certainly not in soldiers elite soldiers so the book's all about getting that <laughs> viewpoint and then sort of saying it's okay to put your hand up and actually be one of the first to put your hand up and say, actually, I've got an issue. And I think from what I'm reading in the book, I'm no expert, but I think the army and uh, apply much more focus to this these days. Yeah, definitely. Mm. It's a very interesting thing to be reading about because um, you see it coming coming back in several films as well. So it's a really interesting topic to keep researching. Mm. And um, mm. that's great. And Christian, what about yourself? What was the kind of draw for you from reading about the role of uh, Dominic? Mm. What kind of drew you to his character? I think we said this on set, the first thing I remember is award-winning director, <laughs> which <laughs> always catches your eye. Um, you know, it shows. So it's all thanks to Alistair, really. <laughs> so, well, yeah. you know, it's not just that, I think it was also, I remember seeing Simon in, is it Voice Voice of Belief, I've got that Voice right? Of belief, yeah. And again, yeah. an absolutely incendiary monologue at the end of that, and you know, he won a few yeah. Best Actor awards there, and I think... There's only so many, you know, you only get to do so many projects. So you want to make them count. You want to make them as good as they can possibly be. And so to work with people that, you know, are dedicated, are committed, are talented, and are writing good material is just, you know, it, it's kind of what you want to be doing. Um, and I think that's my other very early memory of this film was was the script. Um, and it, it's a really quite a simple story. So in the wrong hands, it could have been written awfully. And it was, and I've, I always remember that the, one of the first things I remember is the first page of the script, which loads of my favourite scenes didn't make it into the final cut, but that's fine, I'll get over it. Um, but some of the really early scenes, I just found it so interesting. You've got this guy sat in a cell who's just been convicted of murder, and Barrister walks in, and what's the first thing they start talking about? How comfortable his clothes are. And it's just so, it rang really true in the way that you know, people don't come out and start spilling their heart out. They will talk about absolutely nothing, the most boring, banal, day to day things to avoid talking about the thing, you know, the, the big thing that's actually going on. And I just thought, you know, there were so many moments like that throughout the script that really rung true and made this think, this is going to be so much fun to play because it's going to be so much more about what's not being said than talking about shoes and, and, yeah. and comb. And stuff like that. Some of the lovely moments, Christian, like that is when we're just sitting there and having fish and chips dinner. Yeah. And there's a little bit of that in the film, but that's, that was great. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I think it was that attention to detail as well, well, actually, that played through throughout, you know, the, the fish and chips in the, in the paper, the beautiful cake that, you know, Gorgeously made, made 70s style cake. That made, did it make, even make it into the vinyl cut? Maybe a second? Uh, couple yes, of it seconds? Did. It yeah, did. yeah. yeah. They had the photo frame in the corner. Me and Rita ran off to shoot a photo outside the, <laughs> on the, on the windiest day. The yeah. windiest day of all time. I don't even don't think the yeah. photo made the final cut. So it's just that little. That, little Is that the cake, by <laughs> the way, that it's just kind of before she had to get to go for the knife? That cake? Yeah. Yep. I was yeah. actually thinking when I was re watching it, I was like, that cake looks really good. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just like, I know she's going to go for it, but like, wow, that cake is great. Yeah, um, and so 70s as well, so 70s. With mm. the little cherries on top, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Very, very 70s. Yeah. Um, it was one of those things that, like um, where I think one of the, the, the best parts about this, I think when you're making any kind of short film, um, and like the, the whole sort of kind of individual, what drew them to 
to the um, the world. But I'm hoping what everyone has got out of this at the end is a lot of new material. It, it gave them a lot of scope to experiment, to try new things, to expand on their um, their work that they've done already. And I think it was quite. I'm, I'm hoping everyone has got a lot of new material that they can take away from this film and yeah. show off future in their careers, basically. Mm. Yeah, because yeah. every single character had very different, um, they're all complex in their different ways. Exactly. But exactly. What, um, what kind of sprung to me when I was first watching it was that when Dominic's character is kind of talking about how his mum passed away and kind of Brooks come in and kind of switch her off her feet, kind of him off his feet and kind of goes off on this love uh, adventure and it's almost like she's kind of replacing a part that was missing in the puzzle. And then when it seems that also Dominic Scott kind of, um, his mother's taught him kind of family morals, family should all put together, family was important. And she says that as well when she's just committed the act. Can I, can I see what happens in the film or no? Um, when she's done something. <laughs> she, she mentions the same morals, that yeah. she mentions the same beliefs that are kind of important to Dominic. So that was kind of, Interesting. What was that like? Kind of getting into that frame, that state of mind to kind of play Dominic's character. I think one of the other things that really stood out to me at the start of this whole process was, was I guess the almost the the gender roles within this. And again, thinking about our gender roles in the seventies, especially in seventies sort of dramas, usually would have been portrayed. And I really like the way things were sort of subverted here in terms of you had a really strong, really independent. Uh, female lead you had um, and I think Simon's points about PTSD are really interesting here because you know it shows you know that inherent vulnerability and I think Dominic is ultimately you know a very very vulnerable character throughout the whole of this he's you know he's inside for murder but he's not your typical murderer and I think it's quite nice to subvert that because you're starting off with the idea that this is a guy who's guilty who has killed someone and throughout I think you have to start with him as the bad guy but every bad guy has their own intentions mm -hmm. and their own sort of morals, and as you say, the things that drive them. So mm -hmm. I think it was really interesting to see him tiptoeing down those lines of, you know, having morals and having belief and I guess love that's so strong that will make him do some very powerful things. Yeah, and the relationship, obviously, because family seems quite an important thing because he keeps talking about how James were almost him, were almost brothers in that kind of sense. Did you did you guys kind of hang out? on set kind of to, to get that brotherly bond. Did you guys do that quite a lot? We, we hardly got a chance to, did we? <laughs> yeah. I mean, there was like a day before the, <laughs> we met. I mean, and I think, did we have a, a rehearsal thing with yeah, us? Yeah, we, we had some rehearsals. Yeah, we had the, what, and had some, couple, uh, some earlier calls and improvisation techniques and so on. But uh, mm. yeah, you don't always get the opportunity because we, we filmed in the two chunks. So the, fir the first yeah. chunk of filming in, in the courthouse, I, I wasn't needed for that yeah. part. Um, so we didn't get to hang out until really the, the second phase of shooting, which was several days around a, a, a lovely little pub. Yeah, and I think the other thing is we didn't actually get, there were no scenes in the film of us with our friendship intact. You know, there yeah, was the, you yeah. know, it was, it was the Tikane friendship. So I almost didn't want to, you know, Have my, the brotherly much, one, my, yeah. much to Simon's lovely. I didn't want to get into him too much. I always find that so, so difficult, like to go, yeah, yeah. I'm going to be your best mate and then I'm going to yeah. get into an argument with you. And it's almost so... You know, yeah, you almost want to keep a little bit of that vibe. Uh, I, I definitely agree with that, Christian, because it's it's a sort of whatever goes before this film and their friendship and their youth. Uh, and you know, we spoke about that in, in, in prep. But when you get to the point the film's starting, he's uh, James has come back from the army. He's been given a job by um, by your character, and it's already started going wrong between them because of what he wants and what he's taken mm. uh, and there's all this she's mine stuff it, it's it's two guys arguing over over a girl but they are so vulnerable and back then you couldn't show that and like as you say the female the, the female lead being so strong it's really interesting dynamic yeah because i really liked i thought brooke's character was very interesting rita because um as she said, as I kind of, she kind of came in towards Dominic, but also James' life at the same time, but also she's quite a very manipulative oh, character yeah. as well. So what was it for you kind of getting into her mindset to play to play the role of Brooke? Well, um, it, was, it was very exciting for me personally because I hadn't played this kind of character before. I tend to 
attract like really troubled, like damaged um, young women for some reason. <laughs> and then this character came along and I was like, okay, I remember myself being like this uh, when I was young. Ha <laughs> ha. I turned 30 in two weeks. <laughs> and, um, and yeah, I was, I, I instantly felt a connection or like, it, 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 there's such a beautiful moment when you meet with the character and that doesn't happen by focusing on your role or on your acting and it happens in the action on set it happens by the partners by reacting to what I'm hearing from these two guys and the, and, and the words and everything that comes out of my mouth and my physicality it just happens in the moment and I of course I prepared for it um, like I really delved into the psychology of what she wants and what she's like but I didn't prepare in, in, in the classic sense of preparation I just I just felt that I should leave it for the magic of the set and that will bring it out of me I, I think I think I just trusted everybody and the and the beautiful writing as well and um, yeah I, I think it worked yeah, no, definitely, because the performances were, were were really, really good. And talking about the writing as well, see, because obviously Mark and Alice, you co-wrote this together, when you were kind of looking for the roles and kind of the casting process, if you wish, did, were you looking for, did you have anyone in mind, particular actor-wise, or were you just wishing to see who would come on to audition and see how it went from there? What was kind of your um, process going through we that? Only, we had only mind. one character from my point of view, who I knew who was going to play the role, and that was mm. Mark, because that had kind of been, oh. <laughs> we, we discussed that beforehand. Um, everyone else, uh, it, it was yeah. difficult It was difficult to get somebody in mind um, for each of those characters, and that was why it was quite nice to sort of open the gates and kind of see who, who came to us, who was attracted to the, the storyline and the script, um, mm. which ended up being the three others you see see yeah. here who were the best of the best in those auditions but they um mm. they made the characters themselves we we crafted the words on the pages but i think that's as far as it went in terms of mm. br bringing the, bringing those characters visually onto the screen it very much relied on the right actors and for us to pigeonhole those the that vision too early and we could have been very restricted in who we ended up casting. So we left it mm. very much open. And yeah. the best thing was the right people came for the roles. Absolutely. So, um, so yeah. I think you, you say there, Al, about we, me and uh, the guys making those characters around and building them. But I just want to give you credit because the, the, the techniques you use in your preparation rehearsals to help us find those characters and build them. Yes, we find them, but... The techniques and exercises you do, they're spot on. They, every yeah. film we've worked on together, it's, it's been great for character building and, and finding them. I do come on to that later. Do not worry. I know that's a very important point. I have that later on. Do not worry. Well, there, I'll ask that again. But... special say nice things about our <laughs> 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 yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you, Simon. Just Thank 10 you. minutes, just applaud the director. <laughs> so basically, there's going to be a 10-minute cut of this podcast. Is that what you tell us? Yeah. Um, but no, no, so it's interesting because Mark, for yourself, I mean, when I was watching it, I just kept thinking it must be quite weird. Obviously, uh, which is something you are then acting in as well. I don't know if you've well, done that before, but also um, doing that. Or it's what kind do of you, a beauty of the way that we wrote it in that Al tended to write the things that was between Dom and uh, the junior barrister. So whilst it was the project that I co-wrote, it wasn't the stuff, like the material that I co-wrote. Um, so that allowed me to approach it um kind of freely although we, we obviously had discussions so um there was definitely definitely help there in terms of actually my rehearsal period was about six months because <laughs> i knew the character so well by that point um but yeah it was i'd say it's probably this, this similar to rita's in that i tend to um respond to what is given to me by the other actors um on set whilst having this um having something in mind like knowing what i'm going to do but really just trying to let it flow 
when you know organically when you're on set so i'd done a lot of research and watching of um the tv series crown court uh, i think it's called which was which was on in the 70s so it's very relatable and just getting the voice for example and the maybe the, the walking that the movement um and we'd also spoken to a former uh He's a, he's a QC, so he's very much had the the um, experience and he was the one that gave us the concept for the film. So it was about talking to people like that and getting um, the movement and the, the voice right. But when it came to the responses, um, that I let that flow organically, which I think Rita, um, that's what you were getting at as well. That, that seems to be the way I try and do things, um, especially on this film. It was also really helpful when it was... Um, when we were, me and Christian were on set together, that there was a bit of a divide anyway. Like it was, um, we didn't do too much rehearsals together at all. We didn't discuss it at all really because that was kind of intentional because there was supposed to be this absolute clash of worlds, um, which really helped actually. I, I found it really helped a lot that a lot of the way that we were figuring each other out as people and as actors was when we were shooting. Um, and that was largely intentional in many ways so there were those clashes of personalities and backgrounds basically mm. exciting very exciting no yeah i like the polar opposites in that in the sales scene because obviously you've got obviously the appearance is very different but also your accents are very different mm. and mark's kind of very proper in english and john's is it what accent is that is that a little yeah, what accent is that? Yeah, well, see, because cool. my accents are really bad, and I'm like, I don't want to get the wrong accent here. <laughs> um, but no, it was really good to see the kind of polar opposites, and I really liked how you kind of with Mark's character, you're almost like the voice of reason, and kind of the one kind of encouraging him to constantly tell the truth of the situation. But I liked how it's filmed as well because you've always got kind of Mark's face kind of half hidden, as if there's still more to be told. So I think that was a really nice, uh, nice scene. In terms of the dynamics of it, I love the fact. How often do you see a you know statesman like older solicitor who's very uppity and mm. versus a very young, troubled eighteen-year-old criminal? And it kind of subverted that in a way that's almost quite modern. You know, someone who's young and you know university educated and is a solicitor who's got the entire world in front of them versus someone who's slightly older whose life hasn't maybe panned out the way they hoped is actually thinking about a far more accurate description for so many people. Um, and I thought that dynamic was really interesting. I think, I think it was almost like a conversation between friends, even like mm. um, you opening up, um, <clears throat> and and then Mark having these small reactions, like like thinking about it, about what you said, or like you know, even almost like reminiscing or like imagining mm. stuff. It was very, very, very nice. It, it wasn't this like strict, very gray, serious conversation. No. It was it was something more, yeah. yeah. Yeah, a big thing Deeper. I went through with Al actually was was trying to work out why Dom is talking, because yeah. like it, especially in the context of where you know what happens towards exactly. the end, it's like why does he spend 10, 15 minutes having yeah. this conversation? Because the and it's, still trust mm. somehow, or like yeah, he's yeah. yeah, absolutely, and it's almost he's having to almost justify it, trying to build it up, just trying to talk it out to the point where he it's almost like confession mm. in a way, and, mm. and really getting to that point of being able to just do what he has to do yeah definitely no no definitely and um you seen there was there so you said that there, there were not a lot of rehearsal time beforehand and was that done on purpose on behalf of um Alistair yourself did you not want to rehearse too much or did you want to just wait until it was more organic when you came on the set together or what was kind of the rehearsal yeah process I think I, for yourself yeah, I mean I'd sort of like to utilize a lot of this kind of talking time sort of online sort of it's 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 nice and easy it's not too intense straight away aiming to break the ice and just get rid of some of that immediate social awkwardness so it's not like when everyone does meet on sets it's it's like a really awkward kind of experience it's everyone kind of knows each other a little bit um but i think um i think i probably think everyone here will agree that um over rehearsal uh of, of the roles would have taken away some of the organic nature of the performances um and i think that the the the, the sort of the takes we took nine times out of ten it was uh, what ended up being in the edit was usually the first take it was always the best one because it was the one that had had sort of come from the heart um based on kind of how we'd built it up in in our digital sessions mm. and how each of the guys had worked on their characters individually um so so yeah so had we 
met up more and had we rehearsed more, we might have lost some of that authenticity. Magic. I think. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Magic. Yeah. yeah. I, think I think also, correct me if I'm wrong, but it, uh, for me, it really felt like a theatery um, shooting, like mm. small space. Yeah. Yep. Few people, you know, um, it was very intimate. And then, and the whole shooting felt like the last pieces of rehearsal before opening night or whatever. So everybody <laughs> was on point in, you know, in yeah. costume and everything. And uh, yeah, even, I, I think even we, we were talking about how to, you know, where to put the camera or something like that. And then you all agreed that, okay, let's just do, let's just do it how we would do it on stage. And then it worked out perfectly from, from mm. the first go, I think, if I remember yeah. well. Was that, just yeah. on that as that well, nice. I was just going to mention about, um, I don't know how you guys felt about kind of what we tried to do was allow well we were fortunate to get the locations that we did in the first half of shooting which was the court and the cells which were as authentic as we could but like in the last location which was very small very cramped we f one of the reasons we chose to do it there is simply because it was so tight and restrictive and there wasn't a lot of space and then to make it as as authentic as we could just so that the instant that you walked into that room you were in that world i don't know whether because i didn't act in that and it you know i was so built like preparing it with the team i how did you feel as newcomers just coming into that like, did it help you get into yeah, that just I, for, I, for, for, for our course. benefit for future stuff yeah absolutely yeah as soon okay. as you walk in that, that room i, I remember because this is a pub uh, which I've known throughout my life. When I was 18 years old, it was near where I went to school. I mean, my friends would go and drink there. Um, I'd never been upstairs, but I knew the area. I went to primary school in that village. Mm -hmm. When I went upstairs into that pub, and like, right, here's where the set is, guys. And you walk into the room, you're like, wow, you are. It sounds cheesy, but yeah, you are being transported back. Mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. years. Yeah. And I guess that kind of, oh, sorry. As I say, and the cell too. I mean, it's just mm. such a weird experience. Like, if you look, you can't see it in the film, but you look down on the bench, and there's all the graffiti. There's loads of stuff. It's covered in graffiti. It's been scrawled there by the actual prisoners mm. who were actually setting us up for an actual crime. Amazing. Like, it was the most atmospheric place I think I've ever shot. It was bizarre. Because you're right in the moment of the actor, then really making you feel like you were actually yeah. in that situation. <laughs> oh, that cell, clo that cell door closes and. You oh, feel terrifying, yeah. I yeah. felt the exact same thing. Yeah. Yeah. It was same with, even even the jury scene at the start, it's like you're sat and you're in the box and you're surrounded by eyes. And obviously we didn't have a, a hundred strong press gallery yeah. and such like, yeah, but yeah. you just, just sat there and you feel like everyone's yeah. eyes are on you and it's just the weirdest <laughs> sensation. <laughs> oh, wow, yeah, I can imagine. And um, so I always realise for, for my own films, it's really important to have a kind of good trusting and kind of uh, relationship between the actors and the writers or directors. And you said that, um, Simon, you mentioned yourself, that Alistair had really good techniques and I guess that comes from the bond that you're creating with each other. What was it like kind of building that bond, working together um, on set? I think for an actor, um, having a good director, a good director with a vision and the right shots and all of that, but a director that has that as well as the people skills, the character building skills, really understanding what an actor has to do is, is brilliant. And not every director is like that. Um, and Al's one of a, a select few um, that I've worked with who are really good at that, uh, or fantastic at that. And um, I think uh, we've, we've, We've got on rather well, haven't we? We've done three films together now. Yeah, we've, uh, we've done a lot, right, haven't we? <laughs> we've got a good relationship, haven't we? <laughs> yeah. What was it like for, for, for Rita and Dominic as well, kind of building that kind of relationship with the director, with Al on set? What was it? How did you kind of go through that process on set? Did it come naturally? And what was it kind of like working with working with wonderful Al? <laughs> you can say it was terrible me, it as was. well, guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, for me, it was well. I, I I tend to focus on the human side um, of my, you know, collaborators, and uh, I think I've, I've worked with theatre directors before, mostly who who are very like, ooh, I'm the director. They had this god complex going on, which I absolutely hate because th that is that does not exist anymore. That was in the last century, like the director and actor hierarchy. That that's not, you know, of, of course it it still exists of course in that sense in the classic sense the director is still the boss so to say but 
but there's, there's this very human element that needs to be there. And I think Al gave that fully. And, I, and you know, there was no question in my mind that should I trust what he's saying or, or do I feel comfortable? I felt comfortable from the first moment, even in the rehearsals from my own bedroom. So it was, it was really, it was really smooth actually. And, uh, and uh, I was going through a very difficult time in my life um, in that period. And actually this whole pro process for me was, was like therapy, delving into this character and meeting these guys and everything. It, it took me out of my shell and my whatever, and, <laughs> you know, gave me an escape. And uh, Al was the perfect uh, leader to, to, to do that. So I was really pleased with, with him and, and, and the freedom he gave us. Mm -hmm. He listened to us. He, he was patient. Um, he, he was just, he, he was, he wasn't even, a, he was just like a, a friend, sort of, like a real partner. That's, that, that's all I could say about him. I'm going to make you cry now. <laughs> <laughs> Tear to my heart. <laughs> 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 and what, what about yourself, Dominic, as well? What, what was it like for yourself? Oh, crap. Uh, <laughs> no. Yeah, it's not the greatest. I think I, don't, I think the one thing that really stands out, which is such a hard balance to get, is is you know you have directors that are, you are doing it this way, and then you've got directors that just haven't done the prep and basically want everything to come from the actors. Mm -hmm. And I think I think I've got a really good balance of saying yes and saying no. Um, you know, because I still remember on the very first shooting day because it was a conversation I wanted to have face to face because again you don't really know how someone's actually going to take it until you have the conversation but we had a couple of conversations about the scripts and sort of little changes just as you, as you get to know the character you just think that line doesn't sit right or that line doesn't sit right and one of the biggest things was um, reading through the whole script and again loved the script one of the biggest things was this is really dark you know and it's really you know it's, it's so dark and so in depth that, and especially the depictions of the relationship between Rita and Dom is so you don't see the happy moments. And so it was yeah. a conversation we had, look, that there has to be like a moment when you see what this relationship was like and what the light was and the joy and the reason, the thing that's driving Dom to do the things that he's doing. So basically we looked at, we were talking about, is there a space for a bit of improv or a monologue? I mean, definitely a monologue because I wasn't going to improv in Scouse. It wasn't going to happen. <laughs> but but was, there, was there a place for something there? And um, so went away, had a thing, sort of scribbled a monologue, wrote it, played with it, you know, did it in a couple of rehearsals and, you know, got, had the privilege of performing it, you know, on set, you know, and the fact that that made it into the final film was just, it was really, you know, that's the first thing I've ever written that's ended up, you know, in a final cut, put it that way. Um, so it was a really empowering thing that not many directors would be comfortable enough in their, their vision to allow. Um, so that was a really nice feeling. And have you, and um, this may be a silly question, but your accent, did you have to work on that a lot? Or have you done the accent before? Did it help you get in the character? What was, uh, was it easier I'd, for you? <laughs> I'd, I'd never done it on screen. You know, I'd done it, you know, you know, time to time. But it was one, I was really conscious that I wanted it to be right. Because, you know, I, I won't mention the actor, but I, I would always remember a certain actor who was, you know, very privately school educated, very wealthy, doing an East London accent in a 90s film. And every time I hear it, I shiver. Because, <laughs> and I just, my, my goal for this was to make sure that Scouse people watching the film didn't feel like that. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I went away, got some lessons. Uh, a girl, guy called Salvatore uh, Sorce, who uh, teach, taught at East 15, taught at Central, I think, you know, who's been really good and really got some sessions to get that down. And there's something really, there's a really big advantage of having an accent on screen, which is you can hide behind it in, in that you can build your character out of it. You know, it takes mm. you away from you and into the shoes of yeah. a totally different character. So it was really, mm. really enjoyable to learn. That was great. And how about yourself, Mark? Was it how was it like having obviously a great friend and your kind of coworker being someone who's directing you as well, who you've worked with before? I yeah, no, exactly right. And we've done oh, it's got to be four or five films. Oh, Something like uh, that, quite a few. Yeah. Um, Something <laughs> like that. Um, yeah. And I think that the good thing is that we we absolutely said right, whatever the production situation is, whatever the. Um, budget situation is we will dedicate some time to working in the character and going through the rehearsal process similar to as the guys have laid out like we, we will have face to face well we, we were lucky enough to have face to face chats about the character and things um and i think one of the the things for me is that when we first 
had the idea to do this was that Al was like, well, I've written this character for you. So instantly that's like trust that um, whether I have it straight away or not, eventually it will come. Um, and I think that for me was the biggest sign of, right, this is, um, this is, I want to do the most with this because if you've, someone trusts me enough to, to do it, then I want to. Um, and I, I sort of have to because it, otherwise I would be doing an injustice to them. So that for me is the biggest standout moment. Um, knowing Al, uh, working with him and um, just, yeah, collaborating with him for a few years now. And it's just resulted well, in... Obviously it's working because we've done several projects well, together, so it's good. Yeah, <laughs> well, absolutely. And uh, hopefully many more. And um, I think we've both said that, like, we keep surprising each other every time we work together simply because new things come up. Um, like we did something mm -hmm. which hasn't been seen by anyone because we're not sure whether it's good <laughs> yet or not. But way back last <laughs> Christmas, um, um, which we we just experimented with some stuff and it was a different role for me entirely. Um, and I think I was like, oh, I don't know. I didn't expect you to see you in that role, but you suit it. Um, but I think it's that willingness for each other to try different things and to just experiment just see what comes along and that is that takes a lot of trust and um yeah just a, like like the guys have said uh, a very people orientated way of working so yeah when it was <laughs> <laughs> and i guess um i always like asking this to people who have worked on films together is there one is there one particular scene or moment when you're filming that kind of sticks with you was there quite a difficult scene to get through or was there a kind of a memorable moment when you're on set that you'll always remember when you're you think back at kind of conviction without remorse is there one particular moment that will stay with you or one scene that was very memorable for you all I think uh, I'm going to go first because go for it well, there's loads but it's it was a and it was a very fun set but the thing that sticks with me is I hadn't seen any of the rehearsal or work on the final scene which is um, Dom and Brooke. And the guys have spoken about, you know, improvisations and things they sort of written beforehand and brought them into the film. And I'm in a position, without giving the, um, the film away, I'm in a position where I'm, I'm there, but I can't see what's happening. I can hear it. And listening to that scene between the two of them was making me almost well up. And I'm off, off camera. Uh, I, I'm completely out of the way and I've just I just remember this amazing monologue at the end and I think the tears flow on, on, on screen and it was fantastic mm -hmm. acting guys well done I was really impressed by that oh wonderful that's really nice yeah. what about yourself Rita what was a kind of memorable moment for yourself well yeah I can't leave that out um yeah the, the monologue and um the moment right after the murder obviously but I, I would like to pinpoint another one which was the fish and chips actually um <laughs> that was <laughs> they were really good. Sure, we're talking about the fish and chips. Uh, oh, chips. About 138 cold chips. That scene felt like, I don't know, it just, I, I just felt like I was in drama school with my classmates who, who are my family, sort of. I, it was, I, I felt so myself in that scene, like as Rita and as the character uh, herself. It was just such, a, such an effortless, it's such a personal beautiful moment I don't know it, it, I think there was no word said am I right or was there something said with, between you guys I, I, I'm sure I didn't have any um any text and there were looks going on and it was just so simple but so real mm -hmm. I, I, I love that I, I like I, how you I said that. I was actually sad when it ended <laughs> I like how you said about the looks because there's so many times that happens in the film when you can read yeah. so much of the situation by just either a look between the two guys or either yourself to Dom so that it can tell it can tell quite a lot um, what was the fish and scene? The fish and chips scene. I don't think. What was the? Uh, There's what was very that? small fragments left in the final cut, I think. But it was just sort of a moment where you show that there's something going on between um, Brooke and um, Jesus James. Christ. I'm forgetting the character's name. Sorry, <laughs> James. And James. Your, your lover. <laughs> and then and then oh. uh, Dom oh. uh, suspects it, and he keeps looking at us. And yeah, um, oh. yeah we try to keep yeah. a facade of oh everything's all right we're friends we're having dinner but actually there's really strong tension um, yeah. and yeah but but I think when you start goofing around while shooting that's a really good sign that something's working yeah. and uh, and then when you jump right back into it it's it's just it's just 
you know very enjoyable and yeah yeah, yeah. Well, that, that can help as well when it's sort of six in the morning and you're still going uh you need a bit <laughs> of comedy sometimes to help you uh, along with the tiredness but if there was there was a lot of laughs, I think, mm. uh, behind the scenes. And good, a sense of camaraderie behind the camera as well, which is always important. Oh, yeah, it's That's so good. understated, but it's really important. Yeah. And John was, was the, um, I keep saying the character's name, sorry, <laughs> just because I feel like I've just watched it. That's fine. Um, for yourself, was the, was the cell scene the kind of most memorable mm. one for yourself, or was it the fish and chips yeah, one? Well, what was the most memorable for yourself? I've, I've done last, so I should be able to pinpoint one but I just loved the whole thing end to end it was, it was a really nice gentle introduction to sort of getting used the time to again to sort of get into what this guy's thinking with all of these eyes surrounding you and getting into that sort of headspace of oh shit I've just murdered someone um you know and then the, the cell scene just into it it's just a crazy atmospheric place even you know you could shoot 12 films in that building you know there was an entire yeah. I don't know what it's called but the the room where the prisoner sits on one side and there's a glass and then the you know fam friends and family or the solicitor sit on the other side there was one of those which was one of the most atmospheric rooms I've ever seen and just the whole thing I felt really just fizzled with Mark as I say there's mm. you know reams and reams of other footage that could have gone as the final cut and then yeah the, the one thing I will say about the, the shooting with um, with Simon and Rita in the in the house I've never been that ill on set <laughs> in my life. Oh, really? <laughs> oh, I know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the he one thing I will Ill. remember. Yeah. Yeah, you, can, you, can, you cannot tell it did not come across. Oh, uh, I'm in January, about three in the morning, and you having to be outside in the garden without so your oh, yeah. 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 Oh, dear. The yeah. fact that you can't yeah. tell says everything about LRR makeup artist who literally, oh, yeah. you know, you know how they have to turn people into zombies for The Walking Dead? <laughs> it was like that bit in reverse. <laughs> it was awful yeah like, and I was literally there's a, there was a little bedroom upstairs in the pub and I've never fallen asleep that quickly so many times <laughs> um, oh, in total it would have That's been impressive. what was it one, three four five five days over over about that's impressive what, like, that's very six impressive months or so from uh, the, the first day was oh. August the 31st uh, of last year and the last day was right. mid January this year yeah. right oh wow Oh, that's intense. Yeah. And how about you guys, Alistair and Mark? What was kind of the most memorable scene, either as directing or acting? What was kind of stuck with you or maybe was a bit challenging or what was this memorable uh, moment? Would you like to go first, Dan? Mark? No, Mark, you go for it. Okay. Um, Unless you don't have any mind. Mind. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Mine would be the moment where you, Rita, you said... Um, it was during that, that monologue, that final scene when we filmed that, it was you, you said, oh, you've just given the most perfect performance. And then you said, right, I didn't feel like that was authentic enough. Can we go again, please? And I was like, that's such a professional. Um, and I was like, do you sure? Like, do you want, are you actually sure that you, you yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> because I think we were just stunned that, um, we just watched magic happen and yet you wanted to go again. Um, which is all credit to you. Um, and it well I, I, <laughs> you remember yeah. the moment that's the most important thing <laughs> basically yeah, it's just incredible really good really uh, amazing to see that um just i mean when you, when, when you when you when you feel that there's more to do or like more to go yeah. it's like you know and you need to get it out of you business yeah. <laughs> it's, it's like it's yeah so i i thought i'd try because sometimes i i mean no, no, not sometimes always i used to have I used to be really scared of, you know, suggesting things or like saying, I'm not really happy with this or I'm not like 100% happy with this. And with these guys, I felt like I could be honest. And uh, that was so refreshing mm. and so good. And then they gave me the opportunity to do yeah. it again. And I felt happy after And that, so. quite literally, that was about four o'clock in the morning. So <laughs> yeah. just to add to it, I knew it I wasn't going to be to do it again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, Even so. with self-tapes, when I'm not happy, I, I could... You can do it again. Yeah, exactly. One self tape I did for like seven hours, I think, um, <laughs> till I oh, sent wow. it off. <laughs> till I was uh, perfectly Did you get the part? It, yeah. You must have got the part. Oh. Yes, I did. It was a, yeah, in Doctors well, BC. Oh, nice. your, your working method must be working for you, so don't worry. <laughs> and what about yourself, Alistair? Well, I think... Is it hard to choose? <laughs> it is a bit. I think for me, there was kind of like a moment, and, and 
I, I don't know if every director feels like this, but th there's this moment every time you get on a new set and all your cast and all your crew, all your extras are there and we're in a new location each time. There's a moment I always find where I, I kind of feel like this real urge to be sort of like, right, shall we get started kind of thing. There's, there's this <laughs> moment and, and that that's kind of the, the buzz when you're surrounded by so many great people. There's a... I don't know if it sounds a bit cheesy, but there's like a there's a creative aura in the air, you know, something like that. Vibration, yeah. yeah exactly, you know, there's there's a there's a good feeling, and and you feel very alive in that moment, and it's and it's a really nice feeling. And each time we were in a new set, whether it was the courtroom, the jail cells, or the um, uh, the house scenes, it, it was always the same. Um, each and every time, I got this real buzz each time and 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 yeah. it was it was a sign i felt that it was going to be a really good film mm. that obviously is a very generic point but i do remember if the slightly more specific point and it's a bit funny but i do remember uh, part of that whole camaraderie sort of feeling that um on the very last night when when it you know people hadn't had much sleep and everyone was going a bit delirious we sort of got through it with a good bit of humor i remember we all kept doing accents I don't know if you guys remember that. There was a lot of like funny yeah, yeah, accents yeah. flying about and we kept making jokes. And I remember that. That was a really nice moment. That was, you know, that was good to tie, tie up the film. Mm. So, we yeah. were just trying to put your people off their Liverpool. Your tiredness at its yeah. at the highest yeah. level. <laughs> well, I've got one, actually. I still remember the, uh, the biggest part of the entire cell scene. And it was like the first take. I was really up for it. Oh. We got 30 seconds in. And Mark had forgotten to put his cape yeah. on. I remember <laughs> that. Cape on. I remember that. Yeah, I was just going to say. Um, it's like, Let's yeah, it was him. just halfway through. And we're like, hang on a second. I'm missing something here. Continuity is not right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, yeah, thanks to, to everyone for obviously we, doing it all again. We got some great takes. <laughs> we got some great takes. Yeah. Um, so I know I know we're um, short for time, but I just kind of have one general kind of last question just to round up. I think it's really nice to always kind of ask kind of at the end for maybe people who are starting to act in their life or kind of people who are starting to take acting um, on a professional level. Is there any kind of one piece of advice or that you would give to people who are just starting out kind of in the acting career? Oof. Um, well, let, Anyone I'll can jump that. in, do not worry. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'd go with what um, Rita was referring to earlier and don't over rehearse it, don't overcook it, be in the moment. There, there can be this sort of pressure to get everything perfect and the way you're going to say it and the structure and all these things flying around in your brain and all the plan. And I said how important it is to plan and prep, but don't ever think it. Live the moment. Um, and some of the best performances coming out when you're just being. Uh, I think a lot of the famous actors in America, the Edward Nortons and all these guys, they, they talk about just acting as about being. Yeah, for sure. Mm. Mm. Yeah. I think mine would just be, firstly, just do stuff. Just don't waste time don't don't overthink it just finding it because i think it's so easy in every career but especially this one to compare you know to your friends and to your colleagues and this person's doing this and this person's doing that and this, person's doing that and this and i think the most important thing is to just compete with yourself and just keep improving like i think my goal has always been to in the time frame of a film from a film starting to a film finishing to coming out a year later basically by the time i see it I almost want to know that I've improved so much by that point that I'm almost embarrassed by what I did before and annoyed by what I did before. And so many times I look yeah. back at films that I did two years ago, three years ago, and I kind of shiver a bit. And I think, ah, oh, well, it was lovely at the time, but I go, I would have done it so differently yeah. now. Um, and so as long as you can sort of, you know, you have the evidence, it's a film. Like, as long as you can see your own improvement, then that's really rewarding in and yeah. of itself, I think. You're always learning and improving. You've always got to be learning and improving. And the top Hollywood actors now, they, they have acting... Absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, and so, you know, they're always always learning. And to your point, um, Christy, my, my first films that I did in film, uh, sorry, first films and films, first acting in films, maybe going back about six years, some of the student stuff, I, I wasn't very good. Uh, but then fast forward many <laughs> years, and I've, I've won awards in, in LA and Toronto, and, and, and I'm getting better each film. And, uh, you know, there's, there's more to go, but it's a good path. 
but always learning it's always an important thing just keep learning every time you're going out there mm. i like that mm. how about yourself mark because it must be kind of weird having several kind of hats on a film set because you're obviously acting and um, writing and producing it as yeah, well so yeah um, and that was this is the first film where that's probably been the case right. um i think it was good uh that we as a team absolutely were like right we want to get to the point where even on set everything is done so that we can just then act um and time management was an issue at times like it was always going to be like oh there's not enough time to do the character work there's not enough time to do the producing so yeah it, it was a challenge um but i would say that um the beauty of uh, I guess the casting element was that it was the character that I felt comfortable with um, exploring. Um, but what I would add, and it's sort of a similar point to what the other guys have said, is that, uh, which I've now completely forgotten. Um, right, no. Um, so it's more of a case for film acting, but it does apply to theatre. Um, but usually in film, the character that you take on, you are the only person that's ever going to take that character on. Um so why not just explore, experiment, do it to the absolute fullest and have fun, um, as assuming it fits in with the vision of um, the director and everything. Just go for it. Like You are the only person that's ever going to take that role on. And even if you are in theatre, even if you're playing Henry the, the Fourth or Romeo or whoever, it is your version of that character and be confident to know that what the the choices that you make, um, Your no one else can make of the character. exactly. Exactly, no one else can do it the exact same that you do, and just be confident that what you do is is art. Like it's whether people like it or hate it, it's you, and it's just know that that is is always the most honest way to do it. Basically, that would be my thing. Yeah, it's very well said. Very well said. Is there anything else to add? Maybe um, any more advice at all? Maybe Alistair is our first time directors coming out. Any kind of advice you'd want to give to them? Um, yeah, I think it, it's essentially um, <laughs> hone in on your craft, love what you do. And if you love what you do and you have the passion, you'll make great films, enjoy telling great stories. And, and there you go. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. I don't, I, I, don't know if that's, I don't know if that's a bit oh. generic, but... <laughs> no, no, I think it's very important to kind of have any people and directors will definitely be listening in and wanting to hear what you have to say, so definitely. Um, Vita, did you see yourself? Yeah, yeah. I, I would also say, mostly for actors, I think just try to, I'm, I'm still, you know, working on it, I'm, I'm sure we all are, um, trying to find that delicate balance between letting go and fighting for it. You always have to do apply, network, meet people, blah, blah. But there's also the letting go part of it, which means just give yourself time. It can't happen in the first week. I was determined that when I moved to London, it will happen for me in two years. I gave myself two years. And now it's in my, I'm in my third year. And I now realize that it's a long game and that's fine. And um, the sooner you realize that, you sooner, the sooner you make peace with that, the better. The better your mental health would be and um yeah it's just mm. you, you will feel better generally in life and um yeah just embrace all of that frustration just store it inside use it as a character in your next project or anything it's this there's, there's always good stuff to do with the negative stuff that you're feeling so yeah i, I really like that point because yeah. you, you you've got to you've got to want it you can't want it too much if, yeah if you have a an audition for, for very a big, hard yeah, I mean, if you have an audition for a film you like or, or a well-known director or, or something big or whatever it is, just let it go. As soon as you've finished it, let it go. I know, yeah. yeah. You'll hear back if you hear back. You won't if you won't. Exactly. doesn't mean you did anything wrong. Yeah. Very certain mentality that you can have to get yourself prepared for kind of entry yeah. into as a career, but I think that's all wonderful, wonderful advice. So I think that's kind of our time. If there's anything else anyone wants to kind of pop in or say anything else I think that's um great but I think it's been a wonderful wonderful film I think all the performances were wonderful 
And um, thank you so much for, for letting me ask some questions. <laughs> it was really yeah. interesting. I really enjoyed it. Thanks so for having thank us. So much so for all your much. time. So thank you. Thanks, thank everyone. You. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much to Amy Clarkson and thank you to all the actors that joined us. Um, we absolutely loved doing that interview. Um, Amy did a fantastic job. She really was a professional throughout that and we couldn't have thanked her enough. Um, the perfect person to delve into the acting for the film and to... Um, oh, she's so professional. She had brilliant questions, which, um, and she, you know, really, really well done. As with all the guest hosts, we've been so astounded by um, the guest host um, and the dedication that they've put into their their role as as part of the podcast. Um, we have another podcast to come out next week, um, and there's a small chance of another one after that, but we'll stick to the one after. So this is uh, getting close towards the end of the CWR series. I hope you found it very, very inf um, inf informative. I was about to say informational, then Jiminy Cricket. Um, informative. And... Yeah, what we've been doing throughout the festival, sorry, throughout this series, if you don't know, is offering a 15% off discount um, for anyone that wants to submit into our International Film Festival, the White Year International Film Festival. So, if you want to make use of that, you really do need to use it very soon because our annual event is coming out very shortly um, on the 5th of September for a week long uh, filmmaking. Uh, you know, a celebration really. We, we're, we're featuring some incredible films um, that have been entered into our festival and have won bi monthly awards. So, absolutely make sure you get your submissions in soon using this discount. You have to get it in before the 24th of August, otherwise, you won't make it in this year, I'm afraid. Um, but without further ado, the code. Uh, let me just get it up here. Um, so, I really should know this off by heart because I've said it so many times. But, uh, yes, so the code is. Uh, WDPODCWR891. One more time. WDPODCWR891. And that is for 15% off any submission that you have into our festival. Make sure to get it in soon so you're in time for the annual event coming up. Um, and thank you for listening today. I hope you really enjoyed it. Um, if you want some more information about the film um, or Amy's film and uh, the actors featured, don't hesitate to look in the description and you can um, look up who you want to. So thank you so much and have a great day and uh, hopefully you join us for the next one. Bye.